it's 7 o'clock, so we'll get started. Uh, we want to welcome those who are watching online. So let's start with prayer. Maybe Carrie can make sure they're actually we're online. <laughs> uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for, uh, for the opportunity we have to gather in your name. And we just ask that as we, again, seek to learn uh, how to express ourselves to you, how to pray in various uh, areas of our life and surrendering all of our life to you and learning uh, the different things that we encounter and go through and can talk to you about in order to cultivate a stronger relationship with you and to know you better and for to, to actually grow in our faith and we pray that you will guide us as we do this in Christ's name amen all right we were talking about last week about the prayer of suffering uh, and just different aspects of that, and we're just going to kind of continue that. After this, we have uh, authoritative prayer, and then we have radical or prophetic uh, prayer, and uh, that will conclude the uh, teaching on prayer. It's only taken a year, so. <laughs> well, and I do things, I do them thoroughly, so. Uh, and then, again, I, I'm, I'm, st I'm still kind of debating about what to do next, uh, Originally, my thought was to like how to study the Bible. I mean, but it would be so technical. I don't know how overall beneficial it would be in the sense of if people would actually apply it. Because we talk about how to choose commentaries, how, you know, why there's different translations of the Bible, uh, and choosing a translation of the Bible, and then understanding your choice, things like that. Uh, I don't know how beneficial. And, and then I have a teaching that basically goes into 12 different methods of Bible study. There's various ways you can study the Bible. You can do topical studies or inductive studies. Or there's several different ways. And I just don't know how beneficial that would be. And then other areas I thought about is just talking about things like fasting and in a little bit more detail and some of the other uh, disciplines of our faith like prayer. But, uh, I mean... Still, I mean, I, I, I have an idea of what I think people need, but at the same time, you know, just trying to get clear direction. But anyway, so in one of the values, we talked about the values of the prayer of suffering is that it saves us from superficial victory, uh, that so often uh, victory in Jesus in the church is when you, you can say, well, I have no problems whatsoever, nothing, you know, everything in my life is perfect. And very few people, if any, can ever actually say that with any honesty. And that uh, we have victory because we are in Christ, not because of the circumstances or conditions that we may be going through in a particular period of time. But another value in the prayer of suffering is that it softens our hearts. And, uh, and, and it makes our heart, that should be made, not main, makes our heart sensitive. I think... One of the things that worries me about the church today is indifference. And I don't know if there is a more worrisome sin than the sin of indifference, the sin of just not caring. And I think sometimes we don't care about, I mean, the person across the street, sometimes we don't care about the person beside us in the pew. And it, it, that's one of the more frightening things because... Uh, of all the characteristics that a Christian should maintain, love for others is one of them. Because, and, and we'll get into this when we talk about radical prayer, uh, you cannot love God by, if you don't love others. It is not possible. Uh, John, in his letters and in his gospel, are very, very clear in, in order to love God, we love God through loving each other. And, it, and so if we say we don't love God, then we can't, and if we, and, and we don't love other people, we're liars. And we have to uh, realize that when we have indifference in our heart, we need to be praying, God, break our heart, soften our heart, because our heart has become hardened to those around us. Our hearts have become hardened to those who are lost, but also our hearts have become hardened to those who are suffering, those who are experiencing injustice. And maybe... You, we can blame it on in, you know, of being desensitized because of the news. Uh, if you watch the news regularly, you're really much in danger of being desensitized to things like war, violence, murder, because you hear it every single day. 
and uh, you need to be praying about that. And, you know, even with media, you can become desensitized to sex and to things like that, uh, which we saw a lot in the, in the church in Europe, because in Europe, sexuality is just out in the open. I mean, you open the newspaper, it, it'll be there. Uh, and Europeans, even European Christians, are very desensitized to it. And uh, that's where we need to be praying, God, don't let the culture desensitize me to what's what your heart. I want your heart for the world. I want to hate what you hate, love what you love, and be uh, impacted in, 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 you know, by what impacts you. But also with this, those who have been wounded often make the best healers. And what I mean by that is you learn compassion through your suffering and what you're going through. And then when you see another person going through that suffering, similar or the same, you can help them. Okay? And the thing that we have to realize is that uh, that's God's intent. Not only to use the, your, whatever we suffer to make us more like Christ, but he also wants to use what we're suffering in that we can minister to others. It's always going to be uh, mutual and, and, and beneficial. I don't think it's a, actually a coincidence that this church has the number of people who are widowed or widow or, you know, male or female. It's because why? It's a perfect opportunity for them to minister to one another because only they know what that's like. Okay, while I know what it's like to be married, I don't know what it's like to lose my spouse. And so uh, I think that there's a, there, there's, there, that there, there's a, there's a significant people, and, and you could probably take that with any church, but I think there's a reason for that. Addictions, that there's people in this church who've struggled with addictions. Well, how can that benefit the church? Because they understand. They understand what it means to struggle with addictions. Uh, divorce, I mean, some of the more painful things that we can go through in life but however, if we take those things and we shelter them and we keep them all in and we don't allow ourselves to bleed a little bit for others, then we went through it for nothing. You know, it's not benefiting another person. But if we allow ourselves to go through the pain of sharing it with others and sharing that pain and ministering through that pain, then actually we can help other people. And that actually often brings healing to ourself if we will, if we will do that. The agony that we have endured in our life, God desires to use it to heal other people. And we need to be willing to do that. Now, I, I, I found this quote I really like uh, from Glenn Henson. And it says, the more love sandpapers our heart, the more it quickens us to suffering. And I like that, that, that our heart needs to be sanded down and made soft. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we're willing to hurt. Uh, and we're willing to hurt from other people. And that is the example that Jesus gave us, is that he was willing to suffer for us, and he wants us to be willing to suffer for others. We realize the suffering we have experienced is the starting point for ministering to others. You will not minister if you're not willing to hurt. Okay? And I don't care what the ministry is. Uh, what made me and Carrie go halfway around the world because we hurt knowing they did not know the gospel it's what drove me that pain to realize that there are that 30 to 40 percent of the world's population has never heard a clear presentation of the gospel of Christ okay I hope what moves a uh, a person to work with the children in this church is because they hurt thinking of a child growing up without Christ and at that m very valuable moment in their life, and we've talked about the 414 window, where most people who accept the gospel hear about Jesus first from the age of 4 years old to 14 years old, that that, that, that pain. And, you know, you can't be an effective teacher, you can't be an effective minister of any kind if you don't feel pain for those that you, that you serve. Uh, I mean, if anyone was to ever ask me, what's it like to be a pastor? Pain. That's, that's, that's what it's like to be a pastor. You say, well, why would anyone do it? I don't know why anybody would choose to do it. Uh, when God calls you, it's not really a choice, but it's a thing of, that's how I see pastoring. It's pain. Uh, you know, it's a thing of not just pain for a community that doesn't know God, but pain for, for people who will not draw closer to him, pain to 
uh, when you see someone else struggling with something, you know, even if you see people aging and having physical problems, you feel that pain, and uh, that's part of it. That's part of sharing in Christ's sufferings. To hurt what hurt, you know, what, what hurt Jesus enough to go to the cross was looking at me and you and thinking about us lost in all eternity and in sin. And so he came because of love and died. But love can be, you know, it's painful. I mean, if you've ever had children, you know that. You know, you don't, you would rather die than see your children hurt, okay? And, but we need to have that for other people. Uh, and like when I meet other pastors or missionaries or the missionaries' children or alcoholics or drug addicts or even people who struggle with anger, I connect. Why? Because I've had all those things. I've suffered through those things. And so it helps me and it, will help, it helps us all. And so when you're looking for your place in the kingdom, because all of us have a place to serve, look at where, where have I been hurt? Where have I suffered? And more than likely, that's your place of service. Okay? Because uh, God can help us use our pain with anyone. Now, you know, but just because you've never, you've never experienced addiction doesn't mean you cannot minister to an addict because God can gift you with, with gifts for that. Uh, and one thing that we've got to be really, really careful in doing, even if we're ministering to someone with something, don't compare. <laughs> don't compare your pain with another person's pain. It's not a competition of who hurt the most. All right? uh, everybody hurts differently. Everybody handles things differently. But God can use pain to soften our hearts so we can feel compassion, that we can hurt for others, and this is completely countercultural. Because in America now, it's like, just worry about yourself. Just worry about yourself. And it seemed like COVID amplified that. And that now we just have our little bitty worlds and we ain't going to worry about nobody else. And we have to be really careful because in no way whatsoever is that pleasing to God. Okay, third thing. Suffering helps us to become more like Christ. Christ suffered, okay? And so uh, if we want to be more like Jesus, we will share in his sufferings. It doesn't mean we're going to be crucified. It doesn't mean that we should desire martyrdom. It means that we're willing to hurt for other people. The pain, again, the pain of us being lost brought Jesus from eternity to earth to die on a cross. The pain of your neighbor or your family member being lost is what will drive you to witness. It will, it will be birthed out of the pain of love for that person. Okay? So what should we do? Okay, for one, and we're going to look for it, look at the Bible. Uh, anytime we we want to think about what should we do in a given situation, I think every decision we make, we should uh, be able to base it biblically. Uh, and I mean, small and big. Do I have a biblical justification to or to not do what I'm about to do? But what should we do? One thing, we should be like Moses. Well, what was one of Moses's characteristics? He wouldn't give up on people. You know, he didn't give up on people. The people of Israel, I mean, he's up on the mountain talking with God. He just led them out of Egypt. You know, the, they just saw the Red Sea split in half, walked across on dry ground. Everything's going great. He's up there getting the law of God, and they're down there making a golden calf. It would have been easy to say, God, just kill them, and let's start over. Okay? Uh, and But what did what, look at the prayer of Moses, and this is... This is just amazing, okay? The next day, Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin, okay? Uh, and that's exactly what Moses does. And Moses argues with God to not destroy them, okay? And look at what he says. I mean, this, this is love. This is actually willing to suffer. He says, but now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. That's love for the people. Okay? That, hey, if you're going if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, to destroy them, destroy me. That's, that's love. Okay? Uh, and I, I think most people understand this love with people that love them. Okay, we understand well, our children or our spouse, 
But we're talking about people who just made a golden calf of idolatry, betrayed everything you did. I mean, you went before the Pharaoh and you did all these things and you came and delivered them and, and did incredible things through God and then they just go and make a golden calf. Okay? Uh, <laughs> there's times I actually have to remind myself when I see people in the church not doing the things that make them grow or going anti-God in their decisions because sometimes I'm like, God, kill them. <laughs> you know? uh, but, you know, God... Bring them back. Help them to see who you are and, and what you do. So we need to be more like uh, Moses. And I mean, when you look at that, you just have to think, wow. Uh, in some ways, what a careless, loving prayer. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's kind of a thing where... Uh, how easy it is to go along with the crowd. You know, I mean, I think that's kind of a thing that we forget. And this is something, you know, and, and, and we talk about with people who suffer from addiction. You've got to change your habits. You've got to change, you know, especially like chemical addiction like drugs and alcohol. You've got to change your habits, but you also got to change out who you're hanging around. Because if you don't, you're going to go around, you, oh, I'll, I'll influence them. And it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, a person who wants to date a non they're they're a Christian and they want to date a non-Christian and the thought is I will influence them chances are they will influence the Christian in a negative way and we have to be really 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 careful about that kind of mentality we got to realize the power that is in darkness as well as the power of the gospel uh, but God's desire will bring us to this place it's not this is not something you can just choose to do one day you got to let God transform your heart to love the way Moses loved. Okay? Daniel, we need to be like Daniel. Not this one, but the one you know, in the Bible. Okay? Uh, <laughs> mediate between God and others. Okay? Now think about it. Daniel lived in a life of luxury in the courts of Babylon. Okay? Uh, and one day, Daniel was reading the book of Jeremiah. It's amazing what happens when you actually read the Bible. And it leads to perhaps one of the most amazing prayers outside of the prayers of Jesus that anyone has ever prayed. He prays for repentance, but not for himself, for the people and for Israel. Daniel's prayer of repentance for the people of Israel. He refuses to stand self-righteously by and distance himself from the sins of the people of Israel. And instead, he identifies with him. And if you, ever, if you want to read it, you can read it in uh, Daniel chapter 9. Okay? And if you read Daniel chapter 9, one thing you should know, look at he doesn't say they have sinned. They have done wrong. He says we. We have sinned and done wrong. We have not listened. We have sinned against you. And he includes himself with them. So often when we see people who are in sin, we almost want to say, you know, the, the, they're, they're, they're the problem, they're the sinners, God, for, you know, horrible, forgive them, you know, help them or whatever, instead of inclu being inclusive. And I don't think we realize in the church that we're supposed to be one. And if one, and, and I, I'm a strong believer, now a lot of people may disagree with this, but I think I have a lot of theolog theological uh, evidence to back this up. In a church, the power of the, of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit takes place when we are all in one accord. If you've got a group or one over here and got secret sins in their life, I think it affects the overall spirituality of the church. Okay? I'll just, I'll, I'll just put that there are days in which, um, Sundays in which I preach or Wednesdays in which I teach that I can tell people are praying because of the way the message comes out. And then I can, there's times in which I feel resistance. Not because of the content, because people's hearts are hardened, and you can sense that in the pulpit. And, uh, and, and, we, you know, and, and one of the things that I've done is I've started, when I repent, and I repent quite often, I repent on behalf of the whole church uh, of different things. Now, let me just say this. For eternal God-given forgiveness... Okay, I cannot repent of your sins. Of course I can't. However, uh, look at the Lord's Prayer. Not one time is the pronoun singular. Our Father who is in heaven, 
forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. That we can pray these type of prayers. Again, for a person to get saved and for a person to receive forgiveness, they individually have to do it. But we have to realize that we are one. Daniel repents on behalf of the people. He mediates between God and them. Okay? Uh, and again, you know, we can argue the theological issues here. But the point is that Daniel suffered with the sins of the people. And he didn't isolate himself from them, but connected himself to them. Okay? If you see someone in the church who's going astray, do you hurt? I mean, does it hurt you? No, okay, I'm the shepherd, and God gives that to me. But does it bother you? Does it bother you? Okay, not in, and we've got to be really careful that it's not in some kind of self-righteous way. of, Oh, God, they're not near as holy as I am. Not that, but oh, my goodness, they're making horrible decisions. That's going to lead them to destruction. Uh, it should, it should. And, 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 and when you feel that, okay, whether it's parents making poor decisions with their children or husbands and wives making poor decisions or people making poor decisions with their money or their lack of commitment to Christ or their lack of commitment to the church, what do you let that pain do? Well, kind of the point of this, let that pain make you pray for them, intercede for them. Again, the Lord's prayer is are, not mine. In Daniel 9, uh, 18b, we do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy that we can ask. And again, that's just an amazing prayer. Uh, but read, read Daniel 9 when you have a chance, because uh, really, that prayer is really incredible. Okay, there's other examples in the Bible that we can see. Uh, Joseph and his exile, all that he suffered, and the way that he could pray Mary at Calvary, Stephen while he's being stoned, God, don't hold this against them, you know. Uh, the prayer of Jesus from the cross is just amazing. Paul, in his numerous difficulties, uh, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, uh, he, he writes about, of the, you know, talks about people who've suffered through those things. The world wasn't worthy of them, Hebrews 11 says. Okay, so remember in the prayer of suffering, we're not talking about suffering for suffering's sake, okay, but consciously bearing another person's sorrows or another person's sins so that they might be healed and given life. Praying for them that they might have that. Okay? George MacDonald said this, The Son of God suffered unto death, not that men might not suffer, but that their, that their sufferings might be like his. And I really like that too. I mean, you'll hear a lot of preaching. I mean, I've heard this preach that Jesus suffered for us that we don't have to suffer uh, I even heard a guy preach one time that because Jesus sweat on the cross, that if you have a job in which you sweat, you're out of the will of God. I've heard that preached. Uh, it's amazing how we can mutilate. And one of my students once, I mean, and some of it was a language issue, you know, because he was trying to translate it into English. He's like, how in the world can we rape Scripture? And, I, and actually, I thought that was a good theological definition of what some people are doing with the Word of God uh, and how they abuse it for their own purposes. But, so, by the way, if you have a job in which you sweat, somebody thinks you're a sinner. So, okay. okay, there's a passive side and an active side to the prayer of suffering, and we'll talk about the passive side first. This involves the many trials that come into our daily lives, uh, they can be anywhere from annoying to absolutely tragic. You know, we've been talking about some of this stuff in, in the James discussion on Sunday. Okay? There's things that come into our life that just annoy us, and that's a type of suffering. Okay? Uh, and then there's some that are just absolutely horrible and, tra and tragic. And uh, James says they crowd into our lives, and we should welcome them as friends. And because that God will use them for, for our good. Some come because of our disobedience and our sin. Now, we have to admit that, that we have troubles, uh, and some of them we bring upon ourselves. You know, don't go to the mall. Of course, you can't really use that here because you don't really have a mall. Uh, don't, go to, don't get on Amazon and max out your credit card and then blame God because you can't buy food next week, Okay. Uh, sometimes we, we, we put ourselves into suffering. We have to admit that. Sometimes we suffer because we disobey. 
okay? Uh, you know, I mean, e even when the whole concept of tithing, you know, Malachi tells us that when we are faithful in, in tithes and offerings, that not only does God bless us, but that he rebukes the devourer from our life. And so if the devourer is in your life, are you welcoming him? You know? And so we have to keep that in mind. But other suffering comes in our life simply because we live in an evil world. You know, and it's, it's a bad economy. Uh, you know, the politics of our government, the decisions they make, sometimes conflicts in family, personal, family, job, nation, sometimes just an accident. Uh, but when we suffer things that we cannot control, the Bible says that we are to endure them patiently in trusting in God. And James actually tells us, as we've talked about on Sunday, to count them as pure joy. Because we know that God will use them for our good, and that good is to make us more like Christ if we see it from his perspective. And again, James tells us to ask for wisdom in order to see it from his perspective. And biblical wisdom is living God's way in God's world. Okay? The prayer of suffering increases our ability to see trials and sorrows from a biblical perspective. Okay? So if you're in a situation where you're thinking, why me? Uh, the Bible has an answer for that. God's at work. Okay? We can be assured that God is sovereign, that he is in control, and that he will use all everything for our good, and in the end, he will set all things right. If someone is coming against you in time, God will set things right. And, I mean, the, you know, the, the book of Revelation brings that out very, very clearly. And so it's a thing of... Uh, I think the problem is that all too often either we refuse to believe or don't believe God is sovereign. And it is, a, it is an issue in which causes us great distress. Because if you don't believe God is sovereign, then you think the devil can do what he wants. And I don't believe the devil can do what he wants. I don't believe the devil can do anything in my life that God doesn't allow him to do. And so if something comes into my life, if I encounter suffering, why, I might hate it, I don't want it, I don't like it. I, you know, it might even be the devil brought it on that God still allowed it to happen. And the book of Job is a very good indication of that. Okay? And always remember that no matter what we go through, uh, God will not do, uh, allow anything in your life that two things don't happen as a Christian. One, that they will not, they're not for your good. He will use them for your good, and that good, of course, is making us more like Jesus. That good is not giving us a healthy bank account or living forever, or it is to make us like Christ. But also, in anything that works out in our life, it will be for his glory. God will do nothing for his glory that's not also for your good. Now, that's an amazing thought. Okay? If you recognize who God is, he will do nothing for his glory that is not also for the good of his people. And he will do nothing for his people that is not also for his glory. That those two things for God go hand in hand together. Okay? Now this does not mean that we are passive and indifferent to injustice and evil in the world around us. We should do something when we can. We should stop evil when we can. We should fight against evil when we can. We should remove injustice when we can. We should remove evil from the world when we can. Okay? Uh, we, can we can help those who are suffering when we can. Uh, but I'm, what I'm talking about is in being passive is that we fight. You know, sometimes what we do, though, is we fight against every little inconvenience that comes into our life or makes us uncomfortable. Those are the things that we need to let go of. Okay? Uh, it's amazing how much energy people will put into not being uncomfortable. Uh, amazing how we think God is more interested in our comfort than, God, than his interest is in our obedience. God is far more interested in you and I being obedient than he is in us being comfortable. God's purpose in this universe is not to make you and me comfortable. Uh, I mean, in my Christian life, God has went out of his way to make me uncomfortable. And, you know, and, and, and put me in situation because why, what happens when I'm uncomfortable? I trust in him. Why? Because I have to. I mean, when I look at my life, there's sometimes I think that God chose to call me into ministry because he knew it made me uncomfortable. 
And if he knew if I was uncomfortable, I would constantly be dependent upon him. But that if I was always comfortable, if I felt like everything he asked me to do, oh, I can do this easily, then where's the dependence? Where's the need? Okay? And if God is asking you to do something in the church, and you think, oh, that's easy. This is nothing. Then you probably need to step up to the plate and do something a little bit more difficult. Because if, if you think I can do this with ease, that this is not a challenge to me at all, that I'm not tempted to give up, that I'm not tempted to grow weary, then you're probably not completely in his will as far as your service in the kingdom. It doesn't mean that he won't use your abilities that he gave you, but it's a thing of when we are uncomfortable, when we're going through things, when we're struggling with things, uh, what do we do? We reach to God, or what we should be doing, God, help me, God, help me. I mean, I don't think a day has went by in the almost three years that I have been here that I haven't said, God, I need you today. I can't do this without you. That's exactly where he wants us because he wants us dependent upon him. Maturity in Christ comes when we take the difficulties, trials, and inconveniences of life and see them from God's perspective, react to them in God's way, and remain obedient despite them and I mean if you're only obedient when life is easy then you're not obedient you know you know if you if you only obey your mom and dad when they give you cookies then or you know if you don't obey them when they there's no there's no reward there uh, that's you know that's some of the problems that you you know you, you can look back in America stuff that we've changed in America like you know like everybody gets a trophy then what you what, what have you created entitlement why are we surprised as a nation that we have a group of young people who are entitled? We made them that way. They weren't born that way. I mean, we are born that way because you're sinful. But, you know, when you reward someone for doing nothing, then they always want to be rewarded. You know? Uh, you know, there's got to be consequences for negative behavior. Okay, so that's the passive side. What about the active side of suffering? This is when we voluntarily embrace the sorrows and griefs of others so they can be free. Okay? And the Bible has a perfect term for this. Weep with those who weep. Okay? Now, however, this does not mean that we carry these sufferings for others forever. We only carry them for a period of time in order to release them, and then we give them to God. Uh, we're not to meant to carry them, but to remove them from those who are weak and cannot carry them. And then eventually we give them together to God uh, for their behalf. And it's relatively a small thing to ask, to hold on to the pain of others just long enough for them to be able to let go. There's a lot of people who are suffering with things because they just don't know how to let go. And we can enter their life carry that suffering until they can come to that point and let go together. Uh, give it together with God. Okay? Now, getting back to the subject of repenting for others. This is not just our church or those we love, but also our enemies. Can we ask God to forgive our enemies? Now, you've got to remember what, who, who we're modeling here. This is Jesus. On the cross... Forgive them who just put me up here, okay? Can we do that? Can we say, God, forgive them? Don't, don't, don't hold what they're doing to me against them. Repenting for them, forgiving them, setting them free. We see not only Jesus doing this, because you say, well, that was Jesus. You know, he's the son of God. Well, just a few weeks later, we see Stephen doing this as he's being stoned to death, okay? Stoning to death. They bury you pretty much up to your waist, and they throw rocks at you till you die, okay? And you know, there's, you know they can't be that good of an aim, you know? They're probably hitting, you know, sometimes I'm sure when people are being stoned, they're like, you know, hit me in the head, hit me in the head, and they're hitting you everywhere but the head. I can't imagine a more painful way to die outside of crucifixion and forgive them. Forgive those who are throwing stones at me. Uh, so it is possible in Christ to pray that prayer and to repent for others. Okay, this quote, let's see who made this quote. Oh, one of my favorite, Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Okay? And if you don't know who Diedrich Bonhoeffer is, you need to, to, to learn who he is. 
Uh, he went to a German concentration camp for, you know, and, and died there. An incredible testimony of his life. And he wrote this, We are taking their distress, talking about suffering for others, we're taking their distress and poverty, their guilt and perdition upon ourselves, and pleading with God for them. We are doing vicariously for them what they cannot do for themselves. And who's he talking about? The Nazis. As they punished him every day. Okay? In the Ravensburg concentration camp in, in, in Europe, 92,000 men, women, and children were murdered okay, in this camp. When, they, when the Allies came in and had liberated Germany and everything and they were going through and you know, taking, disposing of the dead bodies and, you know, and burying them and all that kind of stuff, they found a note beside a child. And they don't know if the, they don't, they're not saying the child wrote this, but they found this note that one of these 92,000 men, women, or children wrote. And this is it. And again, sorry for the size of the font. This is what they wrote on this note. Oh, Lord. Remember not only the men and women of good will, but also those of ill will. But do not remember the suffering they have inflicted on us. Remember the fruits we brought, thanks to this suffering. Our comradeship means our friendship, our loyalty, our humility, the courage, the generosity, the greatness of heart, which had down, which had down, out, all, uh, down out all of this. I think that must be a misquote. And then they come to judgment. Let all the fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. Because of the suffering that these people experienced in the concentration camp, they learned love for one another. Cared for one another in ways they would never, ever have cared. And while it's very hard for us to, to understand this, we do have very, very tiny examples do you remember how nice you were to people after 9-11? Immediately after 9-11? You wouldn't have got, you wouldn't have spoke ill of, to a waitress or someone at the supermarket or someone in church or even someone in your family. When the nation was hurting because of that, it produced love. It produced unity. And that's what you see. Our suffering enables us to love at a greater level. And these people are saying that because of the Germans starved and brutalized and, and murdered us, we had the qualities in the fruit that God wanted us to have. And then they could actually say, God, take that and use it as their forgiveness. Now that's, that's something that we can't understand until we understand Christ on the cross. The idea of repenting for others may be new to us. It may even be very uncomfortable for us. But yes, people do have to repent for themselves to receive forgiveness from God. But here is the incredible wonder. When we repent for others, for some reason, it seems to make it easier and more possible and more likely for them to repent for themselves. Now, I can't really explain the theological reasons behind that, but when we ask God, forgive them. Forgive them. Forgive them for what they're doing. Forgive them for what they're doing to me. Forgive. Somehow it makes it more easy for them to eventually ask God to forgive them. I don't know why. I don't know how. Okay. And then and this doesn't mean that when we pray for someone that we suddenly, they suddenly change and they suddenly become a Christian. That's not what we're saying. But maybe, just maybe, when we release a small amount of grace from our own life towards them, God releases a great amount of grace in their life that they can't ignore anymore. I mean, maybe that's the reason for it. Okay. Now, another concept that we're talking about here is struggling with God. Now, this can make some people uncomfortable, but we do have biblical examples. We see Jacob struggling, wrestling with God. Uh, you know, he grabbed all of the, you know, the, the Lord's leg, you know, bless me. But we can only do that if we're intimate with God, you know, you don't go up and grab the leg of a total stranger. You, you know, you 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 do this to someone you're intimate with, and we don't do this. We don't we don't struggle with God or wrestle with God disrespectfully. 
but we do it because out of love. Uh, you and I, sometimes we have the, the false understanding that any loving relationship will lack struggle. But none of us, there's not a person in this room has a loving relationship that if you think about it and reflect on it, that has completely lacked struggle. Okay? If you love your spouse and you tell me you've never had any difficulties or struggles with them, uh, it's probably not love. Or either you've been married for 30 seconds. Okay? Uh, you're going to struggle. And the struggle uh, is, 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 is consistent with love because uh, it expresses our concern. You know, it, it, your concern is expressed. Now, we're not talking about whining and complaining to God, but pleading our hearts to God, being persistent, wrestling with Him, okay? Uh, persistence, tears, agony, groanings. None of these words can describe a half-hearted, casual prayer when we're actually ta- trying to, to, to wrestle with God. One of the ways we do this fasting. This is a way to wrestle with God. It is an expression of struggle. It shows a sign of seriousness and intensity, a sign of commitment and sincerity, persistence. It is not manipulation. When we fast, you're not twisting God's arm and forcing him to do something. In fasting, we deprive ourselves of something good for the sake of something better. And something greater. Remember, God gave us fasting, so it is a means of His grace. Humanity didn't come up with the concept. Why? Humanity can't come up with God's concepts. It's a means of grace. He came up with it. How does it work? Why does it work? I don't know. But I know this it works. I can say that with absolute certainty it works. Why do you think it's so hard to do? You know? And I ain't talking about the hunger, because, you know, you know, in this, this fast that we had, we were asking people not just to give up, you know, different types of food or whatever, give up something you really like. Because for some people, to skip breakfast, that's nothing. They don't eat breakfast anyway. That's not a fast, you know. If you don't like sweets and you say, well, I'm going to fast sweets, you're not, you're not fasting. Pick something you really, really like and choose not to do that or choose not to have that in your life for a short time, Okay. God is moved by our obedience and by our devotion. He is not being manipulated in fasting, but fasting moves his heart because he sees our sincerity. But he also sees if our motivation is, well, God, okay, I just fasted for three weeks. Now you've got to do what I ask. And God will God don't have to do anything but stay God, all right? Uh, and fasting also is not self-inflicted punishment. It's not penance. As you know, you would see in, in, in a lot of uh, Catholicism and stuff, and, and you know, even like the early Jesuits and that kind of stuff, where they would punish themselves for repentance and that kind of thing. Fasting is not punishment. Okay, it is an expression of us wrestling with God in order to achieve His purpose, His plan, and His will in our life. And the first and foremost purpose of any fast is to get closer to God. The secondary reasons can be whatever we're asking God for. Okay? Now, the church, the body of Christ. When the, body, when the church is called the body of Christ, it's actually not a metaphor. It's a reality. Christ, through the Holy Spirit, continues to live on earth through us, the church. Thus, our sufferings are his sufferings. The sufferings of the church are the sufferings of Christ. He's, he experiences what the... And these sufferings, because they are the sufferings of Christ, uh, are redemptive. If you are a Christian and you are suffering, your suffering can actually play a factor in other people being saved. They are used of God to not only transform us, the church, but also to transform our world 
through us. And uh, when we look at what, from Genesis to Revelation, about God's plan of forming a people that did not end with, with Israel turning their back on the Messiah, but it is, it is in the church, there is no escaping the value of the church, the body and bride of Christ. And for anyone to say, I want no part of that, is to say, I want no part of Christ. And you can't have one and not and, and at the exclusion of the other. It is not possible. And I challenge anybody to come with me with an open Bible and argue that point. Try to convince me biblically that we don't need the church, that I can be a Christian and just stay home and do what I want. Not according to the Word of God, thus not according to God. And it ain't my opinion, it ain't my view, it ain't my argument. It is just basically proclaiming what Scripture so clearly says. Uh, you know, and it's a thing of, okay, you don't want to be a part of us now, but you want to spend eternity with us? Now, you might think, well, you'll be on the other side of the throne and I'll be on this side. That ain't the way heaven really works, you know. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like worship. If you don't enjoy worship on Sunday morning, why do you want to spend all eternity doing that? Because that's what heaven's going to be. It's going to be worship. Okay? Uh, not only are our sufferings his sufferings, but his sufferings should be our sufferings as well. Have you ever woke up in the middle of the night and can't stop thinking about somebody? Why do you think that is? Do you think it's possible God is trying to get you to pray for someone? I mean, there's, and I don't think it's because I'm a pastor. There's times I'll wake up in the middle of the night and think about someone who's not even in our church. Someone, you know, halfway around the world or, or whatever. Anytime you wake up and someone's on your mind, pray for them. You say, well, I don't, what will you pray? Whatever you can think of. God, I have no idea why this person's on my mind, but I believe it's very likely that you have put them on my mind. Okay? And pray for them. Uh, regardless of who they are. Perhaps during that moment, you are feeling the sufferings of Christ. You're feeling what he's feeling for that specific person. And as a church, we should often be woken up for our community and for those around us. Not just those that we care about, not just family members and friends, and, but all lost humanity. All right, so the prayer of the prayer of suffering. Again, I apologize for the font. Dear Heavenly Father, there are so many people hurting today, so many of my church family, so many in our community, so many in this world. Please enable me to join with them in their suffering. I have no idea how to do that. I am tempted to just pray a quick prayer and go about my life, but I know you desire something more. Please take me by the hand and walk down Walk with me down the pathway of their pain so that I can shoulder their burden and help them find peace in you. Amen. Okay. Anything anybody want to say or ask or whatever according to the prayer of suffering? Uh, for those who are watching online, uh, Jamie sharing, you know, that uh, this week was Haley's birthday and that God just kind of reminded her that he feels her pain uh, through, through the verse. And, and he does. I mean, while he has the eternal perspective, while, okay, while God understands where Haley, I mean, because she's with him, and there is no pain, there is no sorrow, there is no wheelchair, there is none of that, yet at the same time, he loves you and Dave, and he still hurts. Okay? Just because he knows, okay, when we experience loss, the knowledge of where that person is, 
doesn't it take miss, doesn't replace missing them. You know, it doesn't replace the pain of that. And it doesn't mean that we, we're lacking faith. It just means we get to see our pain through bigger eyes. Okay? Uh, I was talking with a man this week. It, it's, it's kind of, I, I think it's interesting, kingdom connections. And, 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 okay, when Carrie and I were after China, we spent a year in Alabama at a church in Coleman. And we met a couple in this church. They supported us almost our whole time as missionaries. And uh, Sunday, during the dinner, the man tried to call me at the church, and I didn't know, I couldn't even remember his name or anything. And so I, when I got home, I called him back, and his wife died two weeks ago. Okay? And, but what he wanted me to know is his wife's father used to pastor this church in 1952 and 1953. Ova Combs pastored Kincaid Church of God course they never knew I would be coming to Kincaid and, and, but kingdom connections are just interesting you know that is someone who has supported me a majority of my ministry that I fellowshiped and was a Christian I never met her father didn't know anything and never I, mean, I never heard of Kincaid in my whole life till I came here he actually was and she lived in the it was when the church was on the other side and she lived in the parsonage and everything and uh, it's just interesting how God and so we, whatever reason your pillow gets wet at night with tears, God feels it, okay? Not only does he feel your pain and he is the source of your joy, okay? But he, it, it, we, we do need to embrace his perspective. We knew, do need to see things. I mean, uh, there's something that I was, I was going to share and it's, it keeps slipping my mind. Maybe it's slipping my mind for a reason. Maybe it's... And then you can, you can come up with whatever you reason want. God don't want me to say it. The devil don't want me to say it. Or I'm just getting old. Okay? Uh, but how these... Oh, okay. This is the thing. And in no way whatsoever is this... Okay? When I went with Kay last night... Was it, it was last night to the hospital or Monday night? Was it Monday night? Yeah, it's Monday night. Okay? I, we, we thought Louie was having a heart attack, so I went to the to the to Taylorville and to be with Kay because I could get in and nobody else could get in. And I mean, normally when something like that happens, if it's a woman, Carrie will go because I think that's you know we still we still got the Middle Eastern mindset a little bit. But so so I went up there because I knew I could get in as as the pastor. And then they said they were going to transform the memorial, and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll go with you, Kay. I'm not going to let you drive at night alone because I know you know people you know got more critters around here to run over than anything I've ever seen in my life and so I drove her to there and we waited and everything <laughs> the nurse for Louie was Filipino with a very thick accent the doctor was from India with an even thicker accent <laughs> so basically I was, I was there translating from the nurse who's speaking English by the way <laughs> 2K, but I was the translator. I was taking her English and translating it into K's English, and then the doctor came in and I translated the doctor's English to K's English. Why? Because our church in Dubai was filled with Filipinos and Indians. I met with, I was, I was, I, I spoke with those people every day for a, a long period of, period of my life. Right? Do you think that's by chance that I be the one? Okay, you can say, well, you're the pastor. Of course, you're going to be. Not always. Okay? I can't always be the one that's going to be there. But that God had me there, and I believe knowing, because I could tell Kay, because when, when, when the doctor was telling, it was, you could, you, I wish you could see the reaction. The doctor was telling me what, why Louie, they thought he had a heart attack. And I was like, oh, okay, that's great. And Kay's standing there thinking, he just said he had a heart attack. And he didn't say a heart attack, he said artifact. Okay? And what he was meaning was there was a glitch because of Louie's shaking, the heart monitor picked up the shaking in Louis's hand as his heart, and he was saying, it's just a glitch. But in British Indian English, they say it's an artifact. And Kay was thinking, he's had a heart attack, and she's freaking out. And then I translate it, and she's like, oh, you know. But God cares about the little things. God knows your... And, and if he cares about something so much to make sure that Kay understood the nurse and the doctor, he cares if you're hurting 
He cares if you're afraid. He, and he's there. He just wants you to come to him with that pain. Or he sends someone in the body of Christ to hurt with you. And, and so when it comes to going in and hurting with someone, it doesn't mean that you have the words to take away their pain. Okay? I mean, I sat back, you know, since, since I've been here, and we've had mo- more funerals here than I want to have, and I, and I know, you know, that's just, we're going to have them. I mean, I just, you know, of course you don't like to see people hurt that way. And I, I watch people, and you can tell they don't know what to say. They don't know what to say. And some people will say the dumbest stuff. But with, I know it's with a sincere heart, you know. And I don't know how many times I've heard, all things work for the good of those who love the Lord. I'm like, that's true, but probably not the scripture to share at this exact moment, you know. And I'll just say this. There's something to not say. Silence. The only thing that I have found that's really, really appropriate when someone has experienced loss is absence and silence. That's what they don't need. Okay? They might not need you to go home with them and spend all day with them, but they need to know, I love you. And sometimes that's enough. Okay? They, just don't, they, don't, they, they just need to know that. And so, uh, but yeah, we, we, we need to realize that our Heavenly Father cares about the little things. Carrie. Yeah. For those online, Carrie was saying that we got to be careful when we're praying this prayer and we're asking to to you know to hurt with someone that we you know that in the church that we care about. That if we do that, we got to be very very aware that we then have to take it to God. That it's not our our response that we can't carry that burden either. We're, our goal is to take it to God. I, I mean, I'll give you a, a and, and this is kind of a thing in which uh, I mean maybe in the realm of what we we're talking about. When I first came here, and, and I, I'd say probably for the first two years here, I was really struggling with the pain of pastoring. That, you know, maybe the crowd is not as big as you want, or people don't show up, or you don't see people taking it seriously, or, you know, or people not, not getting close to God as you would like, and, and, you know, and things like that. And, and, I mean, I hurt all the time, mean, and I still do. I mean, I hurt for the church. But what I was doing is I was trying to carry it. And then I realized I'm supposed to feel this. I'm the shepherd. I'm supposed to hurt. Okay. However, I'm not supposed to carry it. I'm supposed to take that pain of my concern that this person's not committed, my concern that this person is playing games with a God, my concern that, you know, and take it to God on their behalf. You know, that's my purpose. Okay. And... And once I realize that, then I still feel the pain, yet I feel the release of giving it to God. And because uh, there for a while, I'm like, God, I can't take this. I, you know, and, and, God, and that's pretty much what God told me. You're not supposed to take it. Okay? You're, you bear the burden, but then you give it to me, and I bring about the, you know, the, the results that you want. All right, anybody else? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 For those online, Betty's talking about you know she's been spending time with Cindy, and then it's hard to see her suffering. And and I think that you know the thing that 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 we're challenged in in this is not only people that we love, but to hurt for people we don't, our enemies. Uh the whole Israeli issue, you know, that's going on, and 
has been hard for me because I love both sides. I've worked with both sides. And, uh, and I pray for both sides. I pray for salvation for both sides because both people groups are lost. And, uh, and it's kind of a thing of, you know, seeing the enormous cruelty that happened on October 7th. I mean, unfath- I mean almost unbelie- it's almost unbelievable because it was so horrible. And yet at the same time, knowing people are just lost. Uh, I mean, there, th- th- over the last couple of weeks, I actually realized I had a channel on my television that I didn't know I had. I actually piggyback off my parents' TV. And I've been watching a Hitler docu- documentaries. And it was amazing as I watched that, and, and I don't think this is me. I think it's things that God's, I felt compassion. That what if someone had given him the gospel at an early age? What if someone had taken the time to share with him. I don't think people are destined to be evil. I think they're, they're evil because they lack Christ. And that many of our enemies, and even those you know, that come against us, they, they're coming against us because they lack the one that we have. I mean, even our government, you know, they don't know him. They can't possibly know him, or they wouldn't be doing the things that they do. And praying for them... Uh, and hurting that they're lost and hurting that they don't see. Uh, I, I mean, I think God's got to be involved in that and so that we don't just, don't just take this and hurt for those we love because non-Christians hurt for those who, who, they don't, who, who they love, but also hurt for those who despitefully use us and uh, for those who put us on a tree like they did Jesus. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this night, and we thank you... And we do ask, Lord, that you will help us to comprehend what it means to pray the prayer of suffering. To suffer for our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also to suffer for a world without Christ. To feel what you feel. To love what you love. To hate what you hate. To feel your pain and also realize that you feel ours. That we thank you that we're in Christ. And being in you and you in us means that we will feel what the other feels. And that when we're stirred by someone in the supermarket or or woken in the middle of the night with someone on our mind, that we won't just dismiss it, but that we'll call out to you. That we'll bring that pain or that burden or that thought to you. Not just our own suffering, but the sufferings of others. And we do live in a world that is suffering tremendously. People who don't have... Uh, enough food, people who can't pay their bills, people who are dying right now, people who are in cages in, in, held by terrorists, and people who have lost people in their life and are in tears. I pray, Lord God, that we will be moved to do what we can, and we can pray, if nothing else. And that is not a small thing. That is a big thing. That is a life-changing thing. And we ask, Lord God, that you will get, make us people of prayer, a church of prayer, that our church will hurt for our community, that we will hurt for our brothers and sisters who, members of their own biological family, don't know you, don't follow you, that we will hurt for them and call out their names. Even though each week we call out our one, we will also talk, take time to call out theirs as well. We ask this in your name. Amen.